from the Enchiridion Militis Christiani, translated as the Handbook for the Militant Christian, or the Manual for the Christian Knight, by the Catholic rhetoricist Erasmus of Rotterdam in the year of our Lord 1503. In this life it is necessary that we be on our guard. To begin with we must be constantly aware of the fact that this life here below has been described as being a type of continual warfare. But dear Erasmus, I can understand how you would think so. I can understand how anyone would think so. I can even understand how anyone might deeply want to think so. Even feel like they need to think so and come to depend on thinking so. Continual warfare. I, I really can understand how you might grab onto that description. I don't mean that as an insult. When their unlucky numbers come up seven times in their famous random strings, do not even the staunchest of atheists struggle with themselves so not to personify the stars? There's no shame in this. I believe it's how we're wired. My dear Erasmus, it seems that we're both sensitive souls who struggled in childhood and in adulthood with having to get along in a world run by men who somehow got the idea that they owned the world and scared everyone else into playing along. So considering that, we can talk honestly, can't we? I mean, really, honestly? Continual warfare. This is a fact that Job, that undefeated soldier of vast experience, tells us so plainly. Okay. I seem to understand that the biblical Job was some kind of very wealthy shepherd, or caravan trader, but I feel kind of mean in harping on the war metaphor thing after the last video. I can get that you might really have identified with Job, and we don't get anyone to look honestly within or consider unseen perspectives by shaming their experience. Even when we mean to console, our words can appear to be shaming to people who are scared, especially when we're afraid to hear their fear. I get you might really have identified with Biblical Job, and I can relate. So let's talk about Job, shall we? Do you really want to hear about the last six weeks of my life? In the last six weeks, my $15 an hour delivery job that I was holding onto like a rock in the middle of the raging river went away. We're right in the middle of this raging river of plague. Yeah, I received an email simply stating that the algorithm had noticed activity on my account, frequently associated with fraud, and that my account was temporarily suspended while the company was investigating. When I called driver support, the agent on the line, this young woman, I forgot her name, but they're trained not to give their real names anyway, this young woman, let's call her Jane, told me that the department handling such matters could only be reached using a form on the company website. So I submitted that form, they get back to me in three to five business days. That was six weeks ago. Continual warfare. Oh, wait. I'm just getting to the juicy part. Want to know what job I had before the delivery gig? My dear Erasmus, I was that agent on the customer support line. I give other people the exact same line that Jane gave me, exactly as I was trained to do. Yeah, I gave that line to one poor schmuck. We could call him Job in some small town in Ireland, probably one of those places where everybody knows each other and personal reputation is queen. This particular Job had received a £5,000 down payment from his client on Monday. That was the money he needed to buy the materials to do the job. When his account got falsely flagged for fraud by the algorithm and the money went boom on Wednesday, guess what I had to tell him? If I wanted to keep my job. That's right, email the department. They'll get back to you in three to five business days. Your reputation, your rent. Let's pretend that's not a thing, okay, Job? Let's see that smile sparkle over the telephone. Thank you for doing business with us. Do you have something to say, Eliphaz? The Lord thwarts the schemes of the crafty so that their hands find no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness and sweeps away the plans of the cunning. How, Eliphaz? If all is sin, does it not also follow that all is innocence? And if I can consider this, then certainly an Almighty can, and probably did, a long time ago. Is it we who declare only one and forget the other, that we may avoid learning from discomfort and avoid the terrible? 
ecstasy of being. So yes, dear Erasmus, I can understand the hunger to see the world as here below and as a state of continual warfare. Why is it that I can't be grateful as I should be that when I did that customer support job, I was doing it in a country with minimum wage? Some recognition of collective bargaining rights, some recognition of the right to strut around experimenting with face paint and cross-dressing at work, and some recognition that women are people? Maybe it's a problem with should. Anyway, judging from her accent, was the workplace so carefree for Jane? Um, yes, silly fuzz? Think now, who that was innocent ever perished, or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. Wow. If that's not a double-edged sword, I've never seen one. Double-edged sword? Have you ever heard of the just world fallacy? Or the just world hypothesis? Just world fallacy? The just world fallacy is the cognitive bias that a person's actions are inherently inclined to bring morally fair and fitting consequences to them. It's the need to believe that all noble actions are eventually rewarded and all evil actions are eventually punished. And since there must be someone to do the rewarding and the punishing, it comes down to needing to believe that consequences come from and are to be expected from a universal force that restores moral balance. Bildad? How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Wow, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable. I yearn to believe in cosmic justice, destiny, divine providence, desert, stability, and moral order as much as you do. Sometimes I desperately need to believe in them, which brings me to the first problem with the just world fallacy, the first of several. What is your problem with our wisdom? Well, so far, the first thing is that the more we need to believe anything, the more we fear its opposite might be true. And then our minds go... Our minds don't do that because we're bad. Our minds do that because we are biological. Anyway, the more we need to believe anything, the harder we work to suppress our fear that the opposite must be true. And the harder we work to convince ourselves and each other that suppressing things makes them actually go away. I know when I'm too emotionally sideways to let myself believe that cosmic justice isn't some kind of sick joke. The last when I start going into those vigilante fantasies where I have to be the universal force myself. <laughs> I didn't say sell me. I said give me. Shit, did I just let that out on the internet? But even if you manage to set aside your doubts about what you're trying to believe, there are a few other problems with the just world fallacy. Are all these words, not to mention foul visions to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? You say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I am pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, and that he would open his lips against you. Oh, so far, isn't our dispute just our differing attempts to rationalize the world? If you accuse me, isn't it your own fear speaking? If you're willing to try on the perspective that I'm inviting you to try, certainly we might find compassion and understanding in our common humanity and humility. What are your other problems with the so-called just world fallacy? Well, when you start with all noble actions are eventually rewarded and all evil actions are eventually punished, it doesn't take much to get to rationalizing away injustice and encouraging others to rationalize away injustice too. The worse the injustice, the more we're tempted to rationalize it away. In fact, rationalizing away injustice when we feel powerless to do anything about it may be the psychological point clinging to fixed notions of cosmic justice in the first place. But don't worry, you three. If you feel so compelled to rationalize away injustice, that likely implies that you're deeply empathic beings, 
even if rationalizing sometimes leads you to tolerate intolerable things. Intolerable things? Well, if that woman is being burned, it must be because she really is a witch. And it must be bad to be a witch, because well, look at what keeps happening to witches. The king must be king because he deserves to be king. The rich must be rich because they deserve to be rich, which I personally wouldn't really have a major problem with, except for the other implication. The poor must be poor because they deserve to be poor. And the just world fallacy kind of comes full circle, doesn't it? I mean, if the world is a dumpster fire, we should just stop whining. Because we're bad. Somehow. Wouldn't anyone who would make decisions for us without asking, anyone who wants power over us without our consent, count on us clinging to the just world fallacy? Why? Well, because then they can count on us to tolerate abuse and manipulation. Because then they can count on us to let ourselves be molded. Because then they can count on us to abandon the conscience implicit within each of us in favor of letting them define noble and evil in ways that serve what they think are their interests. You know, they can make us hate gay people or turn in on ourselves like ingrown toenails just because we want to commit vices when nobody's around, like playing with our bleep bleep. Stuff like that. You have just proven that religion is the opiate of the people. And what will that statement, taken out of its empathic context, no less, be used to justify, O Vladimir? I certainly hope you wouldn't make yourself into a father who would force religion from the people as another would force it upon them. I certainly hope you wouldn't be one to make decisions for us without asking and back those decisions up with implicit threats. I mean, how would you rationalize doing such a thing? Be careful that whatever story you tell over there doesn't become Utopia's undoing. I know, Vladimir. We're all just doing the best we can with what we know. And I demand total silence when I write, too. I'm just more passive-aggressive about it. And I do agree that anyone who would make decisions for us without asking can weaponize our need to feel certain about existence. Which brings me, everyone, to a third problem with a just world fallacy. And what might that be, thou sower of wickedness? Are not your sins endless? Exactly. What? Do I deserve to be poor, Eliphaz? You sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you. I'll take that as a yes. What? A yes that I deserve to be poor. The third problem with the just world fallacy is introspection. You might benefit from some of that. I agree wholeheartedly, actually. But what kind of introspection? What kind? Seeking you shall find. Exactly. What? How do I discern the difference between taking a fearless moral inventory of myself and morbid self-recrimination, better known, as turning in on myself like an ingrown toenail or a shame spiral. I would like to point out briefly two weapons that we should prepare to use in combating the chief vices. These are prayer and knowledge. Dear Rasmus, I want to see the best in you. But you are starting to sound like Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar over here. There are two ways I can read the intent behind your bringing up prayer and knowledge. I so want to believe that you mean the first, that, for instance, I might ask the great mystery of being to free me of notions I only think I need to believe, that I might ask it to free me from the fear that I am but a clod of clay who thinks she must control the uncontrollable, or die. Even if I ask the mystery of being to free me of my need to control, and don't get an answer back, I think it can still be therapeutic even to just frame the request. Christ alone grants the peace that the world cannot give. Okay. There is but one way to attain that peace. We must wage war with ourselves. Well, dear Erasmus, that was the logical conclusion of continual warfare. And the version of introspection that I was afraid you were intending. I apologize for my cognitive dissonance here. But I do find it hard to believe that anyone would think the mental state of the average queer kid 
growing up in an abusive religious household in 1986 in South Dakota would be an ideal state, or that the fruit of such a state would be nourishing to anybody within 100 miles? We must contend fiercely with our vices. God, our peace, is separated from these enemies by an implacable hatred. Hatred? You can't possibly mean to personify the stars in the most horrible way, hon. Sometimes to love well is to hate well. And to hate well is to love well. What need? What need would an immortal god have of hatred? That very human act of deliberately blinding oneself to all that someone else is, that one might make an object of them and withhold empathy from them. Hatred is based in fear, and what need would an infinite god have of fear? How can one hate and remain all-seeing? Or all wise, how could one's nature be virtue then? This all brings me to the fourth problem with the just world fallacy. A fourth problem, you talker? What is the fourth problem? Well, while this email was still on my screen stating what the algorithm had noticed, I stepped on my prescription glasses. And while there were still shards on my apartment floor, I visited a friend for consolation. I don't remember my emotional state at the time, but I had apparently parked in a reserve spot at her complex, having been sure I'd read Visitor. And so even while this one was still speaking, the Sabians swooped down and carried my car away. And while I was still working to replace the $340 that I'd paid these infidels to get my car back, I dropped my external hard drive, losing work I'd spent thousands of hours creating. Yeah, I know. Backup services. Hmm. Premium data backup services or rent? Let's see. Is not God in the heights of heaven? And see how lofty are the highest stars. Yet you say, what does God know? What does your long story have to do with your fourth complaint about the truth that noble actions are rewarded and evil ones punished? Do I deserve to be poor? What? I'm sorry if I have a hard time keeping jobs, y'all. Now it's my fault that I dare this ripe old age to feel. Hey, Culpa. Remember what I said about vigilante fantasies that rise up when I become convinced that cosmic justice is some kind of sadistic joke? Yes. Well, what if the times when, in such morbid self-reflection, I wonder if I deserve the wrath of God and actually fear and resent that it doesn't come? Thinking to be God and his demons to the punch would be the fourth problem. To kill the sinner is to save the man. Where have I heard that before? You didn't just say that, honey, did you? Did you bring the rod upon yourself with this calamity? I don't know, and that would be a fifth problem. What? Searching. Did I bring the rod upon myself? I don't know. And what if I never can know? Was it some part of me divided against me and so deeply suppressed that I don't know, or hatefully won't let myself know it's there? Was it God or some devil? And whether it was someone within me that brought the rod, or someone outside, is it some mysterious sign that I should heed? Or was it a random string of unlucky numbers that mean nothing at all? Then perhaps the sign would be to notice how easily I imagine the existence of parts of myself that accuse me. Then perhaps the sign would be to notice how quickly I presume that life would hide its motives for me, and demand that I discover them so not to be punished. In times of sudden trouble, of strings of calamity, it's only natural that the human mind would do this kind of searching, never solve the riddle it gives itself, and fear that each possible answer is true in turn. It's only natural that the mind would exhaust itself, and in this case, the smarter we are, the faster we spin. But just as there seem to be two ways to interpret the meaning of introspection, there seem to be two ways to relate to my mind when I find it searching. Now on the one hand, perhaps I might begin by remembering what's not been lost, 
even if that's just beingness itself, that's something. Maybe I can remember that most of the urgency is only in my mind, and there's probably more time available than my frightened mind imagines. Then maybe I can get myself out of fight or flight, and then from there perhaps I'll begin to pose a more useful question. Instead of asking who's attacking me, and what do they want, I might begin to ponder. Like, hmm, if I let myself pretend I were in partnership with a friendly universe, what might I be being invited to learn if it were some part of myself asking for my attention? And what might I learn if it was some spirit of the universe? And what might I learn if it were just a random string of unfortunate events that have meaning only in my own brain? Perhaps once I'm out of fight or flight, I can let my cognitive dissonance about what has happened simply be there, and from there surrender into the terrible ecstasy of being. There are only two paths open to you. The one through gratification of the passions leads to perdition, and the other through mortification of the flesh leads to life. Isn't the whole this world or the next world thing a false choice? I can't be the first one since the Council of Nicaea to have thought of this. Which one do you choose? Okay, so those are the stakes of figuring out whom the signs come from and what they mean. It's life or perdition. I guess if that's the case, a little spine-tingling, throat-constricting, out-of-body experience-inducing fight-or-flight would help me discern which kind of introspection is the right kind, and how I might put an end to my mind searching, which is... Of course, an act of rebellion every time. Anyway, dear Erasmus, do you think it's a coincidence that it always seems to be people who want to make decisions for us without asking, or people in the thrall of such people, who are the ones to demand we fear our sensuality and hate our senses? The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, so that you do not do the things you would. That would be kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, wouldn't it? If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If, however, you mortify the flesh by the spirit, you will live. So by mortification, are you recommending great embarrassment or shame of the flesh, or do you mean subduing my bodily desires? Set before your eyes how ungodly it is, how altogether a mad thing to love, to wax pale, to be made lean, to weep, to flatter, and shamefully submit yourself unto a stinking harlot most filthy and rotten, to gape and sing all night at her chamber window. Are you okay? To be made to the lure and be obedient at a beck, nor dare do anything except she nod or wag her head, to suffer a foolish woman to reign over you, to chide you, to lay unkindness one against the other, to fall out, to be made at one again. Erasmus, whatever happened to you was not your fault. You're brilliant, and I really am not trying to make you into a straw man. You deserve better. Set before your eyes how ungodly it is, to give yourself willing unto an impudent and ill-behaved woman, that she might mock, knock, mangle, and spoil you. Okay, I have to say this is becoming cruel and offensive. Where is I beseech you? Among all these things the name of a man. Where is your beard? Wow, do you not realize, like, who you're talking to here? Anyway, I'm sorry for whatever it was that happened to you, hon. Why was there nobody there to stop it? This does bring me to the sixth problem with a just world fallacy, though. I guess this is the perfect segue. The sixth problem is what I can do. With the just world fallacy, once I've realized... Realized. I mean... Convinced myself. That my shitty life must be some sadistic monster god's just reward for thinking I'm entitled to some kind of destiny, or... for being on the front line when I was two. What can you do? Why, I can perform miracles. Miracles? I can transform whatever intelligence might actually be behind 11 dimensions of space and time into my very own personal sock puppet.
stop it! Why did you do that? That is what the Lord doth to those who mix their wools and their linens in a single garment, doing it in front of the children, no less. Have you no decency? Oh, you miraculous disappearer of cemetery funds. That isn't the real reason, and you know it, sir. No. It isn't. Oh god. What have I done? Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let them who accuse God answer him. Brace yourself, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? If you made me, then you know that you saw it good to give me among many things an amygdala to survive, a prefrontal cortex to understand, the wish to be an instrument of the greatest, place, greatest possibilities, and in the knowledge that even the most grievous errors need never be wasted. If you made me, then you already knew where my wisdom and my folly would lead before humans walk the earth. You would have processed your feelings about my outcome long ago, and faster than any human mind could conceive. And if you are almighty, then my examining your justice would be as much a threat to you as the beating of a single cell would be to me in my own heart. You would have infinite patience with me then, and if you corrected me, it would be for my own unfolding and not out of your own anger. If you believe, I mean to condemn you by my questioning, if you and all your majesty will not see, is the expression of only wounded and hardened love. If I do mean to condemn you, then I'm sorry you feel that way. Do you have an arm like God's, and can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor, and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. I don't have an arm like God, or a voice like thunder. And I want to believe that the extraordinarily gifted poet who wrote you as if you were a dude, speaking in the first person, did so as a literary device, as a metaphor. I want to believe that the point of doing so was to point at an implicit nature of things far more sublime than the average angry, cisgender, tough guy. Therefore, I want to believe that in this book of Job, the point is to teach us and in easing the mind from its ceaseless need for certainty, we might finally, in humility, stop missing the point of living. We might finally surrender into the terrible ecstasy of being. Perhaps it's a paradox. Maybe in such a state, we'll play out a destiny, or find a beatific certainty after all. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar, the sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. It ranks first among the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with his sword. Yahweh, I hope your voice speaking in the first person is a your advice. Otherwise I fear that the poet, I mean you Yahweh, I mean you, may have made an unfortunate error in judgment, considering the all-knowing and all-seeing perspective. 
Telling the lesson in the first person seems to reduce the whole point of the story to I'm the toughest guy around and I get to do whatever the hell I please with you because reasons, if I may. Given the tenderness with which Job is portrayed, I really do want to believe that you wouldn't be so crass, which is why it might have been error in judgment to use the literary device. I mean, if you're almighty, you already knew at the beginning of time how humans would react. When you as the creator of everything appear to offer nothing better than because I can and I can do stuff you can't to back up the claim that you own everything, you must have already known that every two-bit cockamamie dictator able to scare enough people would use the very same argument to justify their tyranny, and they'd have armies of apologists ready to back them up with all manner of flowery logic. Considering that most chimpanzees and human five-year-olds know how that sort of thing usually turns out, I can't believe that that's what you'd be wanting to have happen. Well, I guess there is one thing that might get you off the hook here. Dark. What does that mean? 